Marvel Ultimate Alliance was a game developed by Raven Software and published by Activision. Released on October 24, 2006, this game and I have a ton of history. I remember seeing the commercials for this game and having my mind blown. I was a big fan, and still am, of the X-Men animated series and Spider-Man, of course, and this was a game set not only just to combine the X-Men and Spider-Man, but multiple different Marvel heroes all in one game. The last time I could do that was in a fighting game, but this time it was different. They were teaming up to take out a massive force of evil. No longer did I have to fight my friends against other heroes, but work alongside them to save the world. The commercials led me to believe that the stylistic cutscenes being used to promote the game would in fact be the way the game would actually play. My brother was hyped, my best friend Eric was hyped, and I was hyped. I got the game as a gift during the summer of 2006 for being socially promoted, as they put it, from middle school to high school, and upon getting home and playing it, was massively let down because the visuals didn't match up at all from what we had been led to believe. Instead, it was an isometric brawler, very similar to games like Diablo. My best friend Eric and I played the game for a few, but we quickly got bored with it. In our eyes, it wasn't what we were led to believe, and robot bashing quickly just got old. The novelty of being the superheroes wore off incredibly fast, and I would put the game down for a bit. It took months of not knowing what to play for me to put the game back into my PS2 again, but this time around I would play it with my little brother, and after giving it a little bit more time, I quickly fell in love with this game. No, it would never live up to the quality of what we were led to believe the game to be, but this game will always have a special place in my heart for this very simple reason. Spider-Man and the X-Men opened the door for me getting introduced into Marvel, but Ultimate Alliance welcomed me in and helped me get settled. The game is an action RPG. It's very similar to its predecessors, the X-Men Legend series, of which I've never actually gotten a chance to play, but hope to eventually, since I've always heard good things about it. It has you choose and play as four different heroes while being in control of one, and having the AI be in control of the others, or potentially other players if you can manage to gather three others both online and in couch co-op to control the other heroes. You can choose to play cooperatively throughout the story or arcade, which is just a competition to see who gets the most points by the end of the level. Alternatively, if you have no one to play with, you can also freely choose between the other members of your current party so you're not just stuck as one character during the entire duration of the game. You can also swap out heroes at a shield outpost, but you can only do these at the shield outpost and not at will, which kind of stinks. The game has an enormous roster of selectable heroes and even some villains if you manage to get the Xbox 360 version way back in the day. Whether it was through the live marketplace or the gold edition of the game, or the subsequent re-releases on PS4, PC, and Xbox One, the roster of characters caps out at 33, which is just insane when you think about all the other things that come with that. A big shout out to the Ultimate Alliance community for getting this to happen, by the way. The re-releases originally launched without the DLC characters and was later patched in due to heavy fan requests. Each character, while they share the same combos as a standard 3-hit, a stun, a trip, and a pop-up, are mostly unique in animations, voiceover, and powers, for the most part, and super abilities, for the most part. But what's really impressive are the whole suite of character suits each individual character gets. Everyone with the exception of Moon Knight gets four costumes while he gets three. Each individual suit also comes with unique properties to them, and some even change up the characters entirely. It's crazy how in this day and age, suits like these would probably be sold in bundles and probably set you back 15 bucks a pop. I'm looking at you, Marvel's Avengers. One suit costs $15. How far are we fallen, I guess? While all of the suits give you buffs to defense by default, they all come with other unique buffs specifically to that suit. You can further strengthen these buffs by redeeming shield coins you collect throughout your journey in the game. As the norm with games like these, the more you buy, the more expensive the buffs get, so save your coins. The only negative I can really say about this, though, is that certain suits are really strong, and unless you don't mind taking the hit on some of your stats, are potentially detrimental to your character if you don't select it. With the benefit of hindsight, I think a much better system would have been allowing the player to freely swap between the attributes of all the suits that they've unlocked. Since defense is by default a standard on all of these, being able to swap out the first two attributes with other suits' as attributes, so long as they don't stack for the benefit of game balance, for instance, not having two rows of web damage for Spider-Man, this would ideally be a best of both worlds scenario. It would allow you to get the stats that you want without compromising the suit of your choice. The coins aren't just used for suit buffs, however. As an RPG, you gain experience points, and the more you gain and rank up in levels, the more powers you unlock for each individual you play as, or have on your team. While initially you have skill points that can be redeemed to unlock new powers or further bolster existing ones you have, at a certain point those skill points 
kind of cap out, and further upgrades will cost you shield coins. This is a good countermeasure to have players continue to collect coins and not have a system become useless, as you still gain incremental increases to health and the likes with each passing rank up. Having things have meaning and value help the grind exponentially, and not having systems become useless and fall by the wayside is good game design. If the system is a little too complicated for you, however, or if you simply just don't care to be constantly in menus, the game does feature an auto-upgrade system, which works pretty well, and I would highly recommend that if you're playing the game with a friend to not slow the pace down. As mentioned earlier, every hero or villain comes with a mostly unique set of powers. The reason I specifically said mostly is that with the roster as large as it is, there is undoubtedly going to be some similar, if not outright duplicated attacks between members of the roster. And this is pretty disappointing, because while there are some attacks that may differ in properties, i.e. fire or ice, etc, etc, they pretty much share the same animations and are indistinguishable from one another. There's no reason why characters like Iron Man, Mr. Fantastic, and Nick Fury should essentially have the same ultimate attack. That's just... yeah, no. Outside of that, each character gets a team buff that powers up the entire party, as well as an individual buff that makes that specific character stronger. They also get a few physical power attacks and an ultimate move, which serves to be the way the game wipes the screen off of mobs and deals good damage to bosses. Some ultimate attacks and even powers, however, are vastly better than others. For example, Spider-Man excels at mob cleanup. His Bungie Bash ultimate attack is an amazing way of neutralizing enemies, but it does zero damage to bosses, whereas characters like Captain America or Wolverine can pretty much do the same and even hurt bosses. The only detriment to their attacks, however, is that the range is capped, whereas Spidey, on the other hand, will not stop until every enemy on screen that isn't a boss is grabbed. Powers, on the other hand, range from being way too good to the point where the rest of your attacks are useless, or they have zero real utility given the pace of the game. Characters like Blade, for example, have these notoriously long charge-up attacks with extremely underwhelming damage that hurt you more in the long run than the enemy, whereas a character like Spider-Man can spam an attack like Web Warrior and melt a boss with extreme ease and dispatch mobs due to its insane damage and quick usage time. This is a problem across the board with many characters in this game, and despite there being some awesome additions, some characters just flat out don't feel good to play because of it. I'm looking at you, Venom. I really wanted to like you. And yes, I did mention bosses. This game has a litany of Marvel's worst, including characters like Winter Soldier, Radioactive Man, Mysterio, Scorpion, Fing Fang Foom, Modok, all whom, upon defeating them, will grant you gear pieces to further bolster your roster. I mean, this game, if you tallied up the roster of playable and non-playable characters, is absolutely jam-packed with anything Marvel-related. It's actually insane and in what I love the most about this game. Yes, the gameplay is very simple and repetitive, and yes, graphically, the game isn't the most amazing thing in the world, and it really couldn't be, considering that this game was not only multi-platform, but also cross-generational. But that doesn't stop the game from being an overall enjoyable experience. The love for Marvel is on such an obvious display here that it's almost impossible not to get drawn into the passion shown off by the developers. Not only is the game jam-packed with Marvel characters, but it also hosts a metric ton of Marvel locations as well. The story is absolutely bonkers and involves Doctor Doom stealing some pretty sensitive contingency plans from S.H.I.E.L.D. that involves zapping the Odin Force away from Odin, and being able to warp and enslave humanity and reality itself to his will. Doctor Doom is virtually unstoppable, and it's up to the heroes to travel through practically every corner of the Marvel Universe to acquire the means of combating Doom, and let me tell you, things get pretty bleak for the heroes. This means not only traveling to places like Atlantis, but also Mephisto's realm, space, Asgard, which is one of my favorite locations in this game, and even a place like Murder World, which hosts some of the most creative Easter eggs I've seen up until this point, featuring some past arcade Activision classics. The game also features some pretty crucial choices that need to be made by your crew, which can vastly change the trajectory of your future in your particular Marvel Universe, encouraging different playthroughs for different scenarios. The buck doesn't stop there, however. Hub worlds also exist in this game, featuring locations like Stark Tower, Asgard, and even the Sanctum Sanctorum. In these locations, you're able to interact with various other Marvel characters, and even do some extracurricular activities, like interacting with trivia machines, which test your Marvel knowledge, and award you XP bonuses for correct answers, and simulation training missions, which are acquired in numerous spots throughout the various locations you're doing missions in, and even some hub worlds. Doing character-specific simulation missions awards you with said character's fourth and final costume if you meet the point criteria upon completion, so these are definitely worth doing. 
The genius behind these two things, however, is that it serves as the perfect introduction into the Marvel world. Unless you're an absolute student on all things Marvel, you're going to get some answers wrong on these trivia questions, and if you're like me and are curious enough as to the why on some of these questions, you'll go down the rabbit hole seeking answers and getting sucked into the lore behind these characters and stories. Alternatively, if you don't really care about that, the character-specific simulation missions have you covered. Say there's a character that you're into but would like to know a little bit more about. The character-specific simulation missions effectively double as not only an experience gainer and a costume unlock, but a pretty decent crash course on the character itself and their origin story, giving you just enough to let you know about them to jolt that curiosity to further learn even more about them. This is an absolute genius move, allowing the player to expand their fandom and get them familiar with more Marvel characters outside of the Spider-Mans and the Wolverines. This is something that I thought would be a no-brainer in something like Marvel's Avengers, considering their heart room challenges, but if I were to compare the things Ultimate Alliance does right to what Avengers doesn't, the NBA would be contacting me to have my home be the new venue for the dunk contest. The only real issue I have with these character-specific simulation missions is that they don't expand to the entire roster and just select members, but there's still a healthy amount, all things considered. Overall, Ultimate Alliance 1, if you can get over that initial hump and have a little patience with it, is an incredibly fun ride. While the gameplay and graphics are admittedly dated, the roster and its incredibly comic booky story alongside its visible love for all things Marvel more than make up for it, and the replayability of it with its multiple outcomes dependent on your choices throughout the game make things interesting enough to at least entice a second playthrough or even more. Marvel Ultimate Alliance 1 left on such a juicy cliffhanger that it left me extremely excited for Ultimate Alliance 2, only to be really disappointed that that cliffhanger, involving a vengeful Galactus making his way over to devour the Earth, got completely abandoned for a loose interpretation of the original Civil War storyline, with some secret war sprinkled in there for good measure. Released three years after the original on September 15, 2009, and developed by Vicarious Visions this time around instead of veteran developers Raven Software, Ultimate Alliance 2 is by proxy the less interesting of the two games. Vicarious Visions does make some changes to the formula, and some really good ones at that, but by and large, the Raven DNA is still very much intact for this game. Attacks and powers still function the same as before, and some returning characters like Spider-Man, for example, have some reworking of their powers to not make them redundant, but also refine their roles in your team composition. Not all of these changes are good, however. Captain America is a prime example of a character who really didn't need a whole lot of changes from his Ultimate Alliance 1 counterpart, but they actively made him worse in this game. The shield throw in Ultimate Alliance 1 was one of the best powers Cap had in that game and made him excellent for crowd control, whereas in this game, the shield throw is one of the most detrimental things you can do with him. Why would you do this, Vicarious Visions? The man has a song about throwing his mighty shield, and instead, I feel like I'm the one who needs to yield. Anyway, the powers feel a lot better in this game than they do in Alliance 1. Alliance 1 had the issue of having a singular power be the meta for that particular character, leaving the other moves to feel somewhat useless by comparison. There were also a lot of redundancies in that game as well, and while Alliance 2 doesn't completely escape that, I feel like it does a lot better job of mitigating it. In Ultimate Alliance 2, the design behind most of the power attacks seemed based on varying degrees of crowd control, but what makes it feel great are the animations, sound design, and camera effects, and the biggest thing added to the game engine by way of a proper physics engine. Enemies and debris go flying off the screen when hit with power attacks, meaning characters like the Hulk and Thor really do feel like the Hulk and Thor, especially when using the game's biggest and newest feature, fusion attacks. Fusion attacks are, by leaps and bounds, my favorite part about this entire game. Gone are the individual ultimate attacks from the first game now being replaced with fusion attacks, which allow you to combine your powers with another hero's for varying degrees of mayhem and awesomeness. Reflect beams off of Captain America's shield with Iron Man. Use Iceman to freeze Wolverine, who upon breaking out will send fragments of ice hurling toward their enemies. Have dueling lightning beams with Thor and Storm. Or group up a bunch of enemies and whip them all away with Spider-Man and Daredevil. The combinations are amazing, even if repetitive by the latter half of the game. Some combinations, however, are incredibly lackluster. This seems to happen more with the brawlers in this game, but when characters like Wolverine and Black Panther team up, there's nothing they can actively do together, so the game just kind of has them... <laughs> running together to take out enemies. This sucks. It sucked back then, and it sucks now. There's no other way to put it. I think a much better way of utilizing this would have been to have fusion attacks like these, where the characters can't combine their powers, be attributed to more of a team buff, which go the way of the Dodo in this game. While a handful of certain characters do receive a character buff in this game, oftentimes associated by executing a certain move to an enemy, none of them outside of Captain America have an active team buff like in the last game. So having a fusion attack, depending on what specific characters you have equipped, temporarily giving the team a buff to defense, or striking, or stamina, or focus, or even support, which doesn't really exist in this game also, could have gone a long way. 
Sure, it may have not been as visually interesting as the actual attack moves, but it still could have been something more than this. Support, like I mentioned earlier, is almost completely gone in this game, so if a character of yours was a favorite in Alliance 1 that had a pretty decent support role and made their way back into Alliance 2, chances are that role got diminished and or axed. Instead, the game focuses really heavily on using fusion attacks to replenish health by scoring out maxed out fusion attacks that in turn drop first aid of which you can use at any time should you pick them up and have them stored. Which also leads into the other problem I was mentioning earlier. Because you have to do these attacks in order to maintain a consistent way to heal your characters, fusion attacks will get old and the only way to really circumvent that is to continually swap out characters to see new combinations, which you can actually do at will now as opposed to the last game where you needed to visit a shield outpost. A much welcome change, as well as the ability to save anywhere. Just hit the start button and you're there. This, however, doesn't really solve the problem. Once you've seen these animations, you know how they're going to play out, and the only thing that differs is the minor character action of those who are doing it. It also highlights another issue, and I'm fully aware that this may be subjective, but this is my review, so take it as you will. The roster in Alliance 2 isn't nearly as good as Alliance 1. With a playable roster of over 30 heroes, and that's with the DLC included, it's 24 without, it's still 3 less than the last game, and with the large majority of them being X-Men related characters, which comic book readers will inevitably comment on being absolutely ridiculous as the only X-Men to even pick a side during this event were Wolverine, Cable, and Storm as the rest stayed neutral, just seems... wrong? If we're not sticking to actual characters used in the Civil War storyline, then why not bring back characters like Doctor Strange or Ghost Rider or fan favorites like Elektra? Or as Moon Knight or Hawkeye or even Cyclops, who was a lot of fun to play in Alliance 1. Hell, there are even some characters that are in this game that were also in the last game that mysteriously aren't playable. Spider-Woman is a prime example, and I'm perplexed as to why. While there are some characters that I'm glad are in this game, particularly the Spider-Man representation, I mean, look at this, it feels like I'm playing a different game. Others like Songbird and Penance, even though Songbird is really awesome to play, are characters that I had zero clue about back when I first played this game because I couldn't afford the Civil War book, so I was going off of what this game was telling me. The game goes to very minimal efforts to explain who these characters are and their stories, so they just come across as uninteresting and wasted character spots, specifically Penance who just shows up out of nowhere to be an underwhelming boss fight before joining your squad. This could have been alleviated by way of the simulation missions like in the first Ultimate Alliance, but no such effort was put into the returning simulation missions in Alliance 2. Instead what we have are varying degrees of mission objectives put into repurposed dev testing rooms. Admittedly, these are a lot of fun, but I think a healthy combination of what the first game did with what this game also incorporated would have been better overall. Instead, if you want to get a better understanding of these characters and their motivations through the actual game, your best bet is to read the dossiers hidden away in the review section of the game in Hub Worlds. Another factor that hurts the roster in this game is that, due to the story conflict, a good chunk of the roster is unavailable to play as because they're aligned with the other side, really skewing things even further into feeling that there's lesser than before. The Civil War storyline choice doesn't just hurt the roster, though, I think it overall hurt the game. Because of this narrative choice, Alliance 2 is incredibly short with a three-act structure in comparison to the first game's five, and part of that is by design. With the choice of going anti-registration or pro, you have two playthroughs to go through. The problem is, however, is that differences between the two sides are very minor, and the first and third act of the game stays exactly the same regardless of choice, with the only thing really changing is who gives a speech at the end of the game. Another problem is that in comparison to the first game where you venture through pockets of the entire Marvel Universe, a large majority of this game is bunker bashing in military bases and just random streets and rooftops. It's visually uninteresting in comparison, and the only good things about it are the set pieces that the game has, but those are few and far between. And when it finally starts to get visually interesting when you visit Wakanda for the last few missions of the game, the game is essentially over, and that's it. And that's a shame, really, because I think visually the game looks amazing. I think it still holds up incredibly well even today. All of the main character models are fantastic, with the exception of the Hulk, because he just... he looks weird. It makes it all the more disappointing, however, that with these new awesome character models, we only get a singular other costume outside of their default for each character as opposed to the four that we got in the last game. A positive, however, is that all of the attributes that were tied to specific suits in the last game are no longer present in this game. Instead, you have passive abilities unlocked depending on which side of the conflict you lie on, with the potential to unlock both if you play through the game again on the opposing side. This is a much better system overall. 
This game is tough because on a technical level, it is vastly superior to the first Ultimate Alliance game in virtually every single way, but if you had to put a gun to my head and tell me to choose only one, the first game on sheer fun factor alone edges it out ever so slightly because of its roster and its story. It just feels like there's more there. If there were a way to combine the first game's story with the second game's gameplay, graphics, and game engine, you'd have a match made in heaven to the perfect Ultimate Alliance game, and it's a shame that the only thing that we really got that was close enough to that was Gazillion's Marvel Heroes, which subsequently was axed by Disney for reasons many still can't understand. I would recommend that anyone who hasn't experienced these games to go out and try it, as both entries are extremely fun, solid titles, but therein lies the problem. Both Ultimate Alliance 1 and 2 have been delisted from every single platform, leaving this game to be an extremely hard find. The only way to play these games would be to find hard copies of the PS3, 360, and PC counterparts, but even those have their caveats. Since you're paying for an older version of the game, the DLC is not included in any of those, meaning you'd be paying for a less complete version of both titles, and since everything regarding the DLC has been delisted from every platform, the DLC is impossible to buy. It's why I wish the subsequent re-releases of these games had a physical run, because unless you bought these titles during their digital re-releases, you're completely out of luck, and that doesn't sit right with me. This is why video game preservation is such an important topic that I hope gets brought to the forefront more. Gatekeeping people from enjoying a game they may want to play due to licensing issues is bound to happen, unfortunately. But in the digital world, completely deleting a footprint from existence? Not a fan. And for those who may ask about a potential Alliance 3 review, well, I don't own a Switch. And since Nintendo's new relaunching of their new Switch model only comes with a screen upgrade and nothing done to power at all, I'd rather save myself a few bucks. It's why I wish that game had been a multi-platform game like the others before it have historically been, but... Money talks, I suppose. Anyways, thank you guys for watching this review. For those of you who may have not seen the Community tab post, for the next couple of reviews I'll be focusing on the handful of titles I have for The Man of Steel, so I'll be seeing you guys in the kryptonite-laced hit piece known as... Superman 64. Oh boy. Catch you guys in the next one.